Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our audiences around the world. There are 189 of you who have joined us today. My name is Bonnie McClafferty. I'm the Chief of Party for Eat Safe and the Director of Food Safety at the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. Gain is delighted to be your host for this event titled Food Safety, a Foundation for Nutrition and Growth. We would like to express our gratitude to the government of Japan for hosting this important Nutrition for Growth Summit and for having the foresight to include the safety of food as part of the global nutrition agenda. Food safety and nutrition are extricably linked. To achieve optimal human health, nutrition, and well being, people must be both well nourished and free from foodborne disease. If food is not safe, how can we reach the challenging nutrition goals we have set for the planet? I am sure many of you have tuned in today and engaged in this space of food and nutrition security. You have observed that research, product development, policy and programming, financing and investments, they all tend to be designed, implemented and measured either from a nutrition standpoint or from a food safety standpoint. The two groups of stakeholders are often not overlapping and not even sitting in the same room, even though both are concerned with improving public health through the food system. At GAIN, our goal is to improve the consumption of safe, nutritious food for all people, especially those most vulnerable to malnutrition. We believe if food is unsafe, it cannot be nutritious. Rooted in this perspective, we approach this mission thoughtfully in our programming and research. Today, we have assembled a panel of experts to explain why progress in reaching global nutrition goals will be hindered if food safety is not considered a nutrition effort. In the interest of time, I will keep my comments brief and pass the microphone over to Dr. Angela Perry Hansen Kunadu, our moderator for today. Angela joins us from Ghana, where she's a food scientist, educator, and researcher in the Department of Nutrition and Food Science at the University of Ghana. She has over 15 years of experience working in academia and in the food industry and shares her passion in improving micro, mi microbial quality and the safety of foods in her teaching and extension activities. Before we dive in though, I would like to share just a few logistical notes. First, to ask questions at any time throughout the day, today's event, please click the Q&A button on your Zoom console, console, and today's event will be recorded. After the session, the recording will be available at the GAIN website at www.gainhealth.org. Dr. Kanadu, over to you. Thank you very much, Bonnie. It's a real pleasure to be here. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our discussion on food safety, a foundation for nutrition and growth. We are thankful that you can join us. You've probably heard the statement, if it isn't safe, it isn't food. Food safety is important for public health, trade and economic development. But more importantly, food safety is critical for food security and nutrition. Recently, FAO reported the need to provide not just nutritious diets, but diets that are safe and nutritious in the efforts towards ending hunger. Nutritious foods cannot be considered nutritious if they are not safe to eat. This goes to highlight the fact that food safety and nutrition are linked. We know that unsafe food and water leads to poor health outcomes and poor health outcomes are associated in many ways with poor nutrition. We also know that improved food safety can positively impact the primary outcomes of nutrition by preventing foodborne illnesses and even death. So much work has gone into putting food safety on the agenda alongside nutrition. And although they have been prioritized and addressed differently in the past, there are now high level discussions and efforts directed at addressing these issues holistically. I congratulate all stakeholders that have contributed to elevating the importance of food safety. 
while there's some information linking nutrition and food safety, there's so much more we do not know. Simple questions remain. How exactly are nutrition and food safety linked? Are there any game-changing evidence that can drive investments in addressing nutrition and food safety challenges together? It is on this backdrop that we are here today to listen and engage with our distinguished speakers uh, on the intricate linkages between food safety and nutrition and provide some of the much needed evidence to champion the cause of safe nutritious diets for all. It is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Stella Nodhagen. Dr. Nodhagen is a senior technical specialist with GAIN, where she oversees research and learning activities related to food systems. Her areas of research include markets related approaches to improving diets and nutrition, nut nutrition sensitive agriculture, gender equity, food environments, and food choice. Prior to joining GAIN, she worked with the NGO Helen Keller International in West Africa for several years. Her previous experience also includes work with the Harvard Initiative for Global Health, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluations, and the International Center for Research on Women. Dr. Nodhagen holds a BA from Middlebury College and an MPhil and PhD from the University of Cambridge. Welcome, Stella. Please have the floor. Thanks so much, Angela, and thanks to everybody who's joining us online today. Um, I'm delighted to kick off this event by talking a bit about some of the interconnected challenges that link food safety and nutrition and why they're topics that need more integrated approaches in the future. Next slide. So given that this is a nutrition for growth side event, I might not need to convince this audience of the importance of malnutrition, but malnutrition remains an important global challenge. It affects a large share of the world's population, with almost a quarter of young children being stunted, 7% being wasted, almost half of adults being overweight or obese, and about half of young children and two-thirds of adult women estimated to suffer from a micronutrient deficiency. Impressive progress has been made on tackling malnutrition, but the world is off course to meet five of the six maternal and child nutrition targets, as well as all three diet-related and CD voluntary targets. And of course, this is important, not just because we like to set targets and meet them, but because undernutrition is associated with an increased risk of mortality and morbidity, with poor cognitive development, with decreased productivity, with adverse birth outcomes, and with conditions linked to particular micronutrient deficiencies such as goiter. At the same time, overweight and obesity are associated with an increased risk of diet-related non-communicable diseases. Indeed, nutrition-related causes routinely rank among the top 10 risk factors driving the global burden of disease. And all of this ill health and well-being comes with a high economic cost, which is estimated at three and a half trillion US dollars per year. Next slide. Now, in addition to being large, the burden of malnutrition and particularly of undernutrition is not equitably distributed. The map here shows rates of child stunting, stunting in children under age five around the world. And you can see that this burden is particularly concentrated in certain regions of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and certain other parts of Asia, and to a lesser extent, Latin America. This data is at the national level. If we were looking at data within countries, we would see additional inequality related to the way in which malnutrition is distributed within countries as well. Next slide. So malnutrition is associated with a large burden of ill health and economic costs, which are unequitably distributed across and within countries. And that makes it very similar to foodborne disease. There are many different causes of foodborne disease. Uh, common ones include bacteria, such as salmonella or E. coli, viruses such as norovirus and hepatitis A, molds, protozoa, helminths um, like pig tapeworm, 
mechanical and physical contaminants such as sand or glass, as well as chemicals such as preservatives, pesticides, and other different types of chemicals. And these can enter the food supply at various stages, everything from production to in-home preparation and consumption. And they can cause both acute illness or injury, as well as raise the risk of long-term chronic disease. For example, both aflatoxin and arsenic have been associated with cancer. It's estimated that foodborne disease is responsible for 600 million cases of illness and almost half a million premature deaths annually. And it also comes with large economic costs, estimated about 20 billion US dollars per year, which does not include the costs associated with lost productivity while being ill. Next slide, please. So the majority of foodborne disease occurs in low and middle income countries, which represent about three quarters of deaths from foodborne illness, despite comprising only 41% of the global population. For example, Africa's per capita burden of foodborne disease is about 27 times that of Europe or North America. Young children are particularly susceptible, shouldering about 40% of the disease burden. And pregnant women are also at increased risk. And foodborne illness, in during pregnancy can lead to adverse pregnancy outcomes. Next slide. So we can see that there are many ways in which malnutrition and foodborne illness are overlapping. They're overlapping in terms of the types of countries that are affected, that they primarily have a large burden in low and middle income countries, particularly those in Africa and South Asia. They're also overlapping burdens within countries across vulnerable groups, young children, pregnant women, low-income consumers, and those without access to sanitation and hygiene and other infrastructure are particularly affected by both. And finally, they're overlapping um, across foods. The greatest known food safety risks are associated with the most nutrient-dense foods, things like animal source foods and fresh vegetables and fruits. Next slide, please. But in addition to being overlapping in terms of where one sees, foodborne disease and malnutrition, foodborne disease and nutrition are also closely linked. And these are links that go not just in one direction from say nutrition to food safety and foodborne disease, but also in the other direction so that food safety can impact nutrition outcomes. And we again have been thinking quite a lot about this topic and how these issues are linked over the past two years. We've done extensive brainstorming in multidisciplinary groups. We conducted several reviews of the literature. And about a year ago, we held an expert workshop bringing together experts from nutrition and food safety, as well as other fields like consumer science. And through all that work, we came up with a simplified way of categorizing and thinking about these bi-directional linkages as occurring along four pathways, health and physiology, consumer behavior, supply chains and markets, and policy and regulation. And these both run in both directions, from food safety to nutrition, and from nutrition to food safety. So in the next slides, I'm gonna give some quick, definitely non-exhaustive examples of the types of linkages we're talking about here. And then later, the panelists will each focus on one of these areas and discuss it in much more detail. Next slide. So the first and most obvious area, and definitely the one with the strongest evidence behind it, has to do with health and physiology. There are many ways in which foodborne illness is connected to nutrition through physiological pathways. For example, foodborne illness can cause acute and chronic reduction in nutrient intake and absorption. Many of us um, have had foodborne disease and know very well that it involves acute gastrointestinal distress, including reduced appetite, vomiting, or diarrhea. When you're sick in this way, a lot of times you don't eat much um, or your body doesn't use that food very effectively. So that can result in impacts on your nutrition. In addition, foodborne illness can impair metabolic processes. Some foodborne hazards can directly impair growth and development. Some foodborne diseases during pregnancy can harm fetal growth. Now, considering linkages in the other direction, ways in which nutrition might affect foodborne illness, we see that optimal nutrition can increase resilience to disease for many different types of diseases. And that likely also includes foodborne disease. Next slide, please. 
So to give an example of one of the specific linkages um, related to health and physiology between nutrition and food safety, this is a classic one um, that probably many in this webinar are familiar with, and this is the relationship between stunting and diarrhea. The graph here on the vertical axis shows the log odds of stunting at age 24 months, and the horizontal axis shows diarrhea, so diarrheal episodes on the left-hand side and the longitudinal prevalence of diarrhea on the right-hand side. And you can see here that the odds of stunting at age 24 months increase with each episode of diarrhea and with each day that a child has diarrhea. So there's a very clear relationship. Certainly foodborne disease is not the only cause of diarrhea. There are many others, but it's a very common one. Um, and it strongly suggests that there's a relationship between foodborne disease and stunting. Next slide, please. So from here on, we're getting a, a little bit more speculative. There's a lot less evidence on the remaining three pathways compared to that for health and physiology. But there's some anecdote and some small studies out there that suggest that these pathways do exist, as does personal experience that I think many of us can relate to. For example, within the area of consumer behavior, concerns over unsafe foods can lead to choices, changes in diet choices. This can include both away from and towards more nutritious foods. For example, if somebody has had a bad experience with purchasing raw spinach in the market and eating it and getting sick, that might lead them to shift their dietary choices away from fresh fruits and vegetables and towards other types of foods. Perhaps it will be towards more highly processed packaged foods, which seems cleaner because they're in a, in a nice package. In that kind of a shift, it's likely to have a negative impact for that person's diet quality. Similarly, if safer foods are more expensive than their less safe equivalents and shoppers value that and choose those foods, that has implications for the family budget for buying other nutritious foods. And from nutrition to foodborne illness, there are also some linkages that we might imagine. We know that better nutrition in the long term can be associated with better educational outcomes, and this might improve the consumer's ability to recognize and demand safer foods, both through knowledge and through access to increased purchasing power. Next slide, please. So to give an example of how the consumer behavior pathway might operate, I want to mention a study by a colleague from Rwanda. At the time the study was done, nutritious complementary porridges um, for feeding to young children that were made with blended flours and fortified with added micronutrients were widely available in the part of Rwanda that the study focused on, but people weren't buying them. So the study was seeking to see why not. And one of the results that it found was that consumers were really determined to blend their own porridge flours at home as opposed to buying them pre-blended because they were worried about the illnesses that could stem from adulterated flours at the market, that there might be something added to the flour that was unsafe to eat and they gave that to their child and that made their child ill. In addition, well, consumers could theoretically have enriched their own porridge at home by using things like ground nuts or ground fish powders. Those were also ingredients that consumers didn't really trust the safety of in the market. So they were reluctant to buy them in order to create their own blended flours at home. The result of this was that children instead were generally being fed unblended, unfortified maize flours, resulting in poorer diet quality. Next slide, please. The third area where we envision potential linkages between food safety and nutrition has to do with the supply chains that bring food from producers um, to consumers. We know that there are food safety measures um, that can be enacted all along the supply chain, for example, a need to comply with stringent standards in the production of a given food, and those can entail costs, which can impact prices. That could lead to reduced consumption which could have an impact on food availability and affordability for lower income consumers. At the same time, if vendors are worried about maybe selling food that's unsafe and that later makes consumers uh, ill, they might preferentially choose to sell foods that they see as being less risky. For example, choosing to, to, to um, sell potatoes as opposed to spinach. Those foods, could be less nutritious, which could again have an impact on availability and affordability of nutritious foods. 
Vendors could also prepare ways, um, prefer, prepare food in ways that might be safer, but could affect the nutritional content, either positively or negatively, such as deep frying, probably not a very positive impact for nutrition, whereas fermentation could be. And going in the other direction from nutrition to foodborne illness, food processing that's intended to improve nutritional content, such as large scale food fortification, um, could also affect safety in either positive or negative ways. For example, if the introduction of fortification technology is used as an opportunity to overall upgrade processing and packaging practices to reduce the risk of contamination, that would be a positive change. If it's maybe not done very well and instead results in introducing contaminants, that could have a negative effect. Next slide, please. To give an example of a specific way in which this might work, I want to mention some research that we did through the Eat Safe project in Bern and Kebi, Nigeria. In this setting, um, consumers were very concerned about the presence of insects in cowpea that they bought at the market. And they were also very concerned about the presence of chemical preservatives in the cowpea used to prevent the infestation with insects. So vendors knew well about consumers' hesitancy related to cowpea, and they had a couple different types of responses. Some vendors simply chose to sell less cowpea, or they would only sell cowpea when they knew that they could assure a very high level of quality. Because cowpea is a very nutritious and fairly affordable legume, this could have a negative effect on its uh, availability and therefore on dietary choices and nutrition. However, some vendors took different approaches. Some developed ways to assess whether or not cowpea was contaminated with chemicals or had insects in it, um, and took steps to demand better quality cowpea from their suppliers. And others adopted new technologies, such as hermetically sealed bags, and were able to explain to consumers how those technologies helped to prevent infestation with cowpea and um, obviate the need for use of chemical preservatives, which could have a positive impact on nutrition. Next slide, please. The final area where we see potential linkages between food safety and nutrition has to do with policy and regulation. Food safety driven recalls um, can reduce the supply of nutritious food, leading to increased price and decreased access for those foods. At the same time, if consumers trust in food safety regulations and compliance, that could encourage them to consume nutritious foods that maybe once they were really worried about that they saw as too risky to consume, and that could have a positive effect. Processing, storage, or preparation guidelines related to food safety could have an impact on nutritional quality. And nutritional labeling and marketing could be interpreted by the consumer um, to imply something about the food being safer or vice versa in the case of food safety related labeling being interpreted to imply something about its nutritional content. Next slide, please. An example of this operating in the real world comes from China in 2004. 13 infants died after drinking nutritionally inadequate infant formula. As a result of that, the government set higher standards for protein levels, they enacted a nutrition policy. Four years later, in 2008, the deliberate addition of melamine to milk was found to sicken thousands and kill six infants. And this occurred because melamine is a chemical that shows up as protein on tests for milk quality. So after the law was enacted, it was added by middlemen to increase the apparent content of protein and encourage purchase. So this is an example of a nutrition related policy having very much unintended consequences related to food safety. Next slide, please. So I hope it's becoming clear um, to those attending that food safety and nutrition are closely interlinked. And this means that intervening to impact one can affect the other. It also means that in some cases, more efficient and effective programs and policies could be achieved by tackling the two issues jointly. Next slide, please. And indeed, these linkages are already being recognized, as Angela mentioned in her remarks, in some important international documents, as shown in the, the two quotes here. But at the same time, as Bonnie mentioned in her remarks, there, that's often not actually embodied in practice on the ground. Many of the major frameworks for food systems and nutrition that guide policy and programming 
don't mention food safety or they mention it very briefly, but it's not actually integrated in any detail into their recommendations or approaches. And similarly, many food safety frameworks and policies don't have much explicit mention of nutrition. So there's really a missed opportunity here for more integrated research policy and programming, bringing together food safety and nutrition. Next slide. There are several options that we can envision for more integrated approaches. One would be to focus policies and programming on highly nutritious foods, while also considering their associated food safety risks. We can focus more on the informal sector in low and middle income countries, which tends to be particularly important for food security and nutrition of low income consumers, but also has certain challenges related to food safety. We can try to understand consumers and supply chain actors, motivations and drivers as relates to both nutrition and food security when they're choosing which products to make available or which products to purchase. We can consider how nutrition interventions might impact food safety and vice versa for food safety interventions. And finally, it's really important to generate more evidence on the linkages between foodborne disease and nutrition and on potentially impactful integrated intervention approaches. Much of the uh, examples that I presented today are from very small studies or particular anecdotes. And a lot of the mechanisms that we've presented are somewhat speculative. So there's a real need for more evidence that can more flesh out in more detail which one of these mechanisms are important and which are important in which contexts and which are the most malleable to different types of interventions. Next slide. So in conclusion, um, I do hope that with a more integrated approach that brings together food safety and nutrition, we can accelerate rate progress to improve nutrition, health, and prosperity, particularly in the highest burden countries and populations. And I really look forward to hearing more from the panelists on concrete ways that we might do this in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much for that insightful presentation on the overview of the bi-directional linkages between food safety and nutrition. I particularly appreciate the actionable integrated approaches to solving nutrition and food safety challenges through research policies and programming. Thank you so much, Stella. We have our esteemed panelists to address the four pathways linking food safety and nutrition in a bit more detail. First, we have Dr. Elisabetta Lambertini, a senior research scientist at GAIN with 15 years experience in food and water safety, health risk modeling, and quantitative decision analysis in food and health systems. She's based in Washington, DC, where she oversees the research activities of the GAIN Eat Safe program. Her expertise is in food safety and quantitative methods with a focus on informal supply chains of nutritious foods in low and middle income countries. Before joining GAIN, she served as principal investigator at the Research Triangle Institute and as research faculty in the departments of nutrition and food science at the University of Maryland and food science and technology at UC Davis. Welcome, Elisabetta. We can't wait to hear your presentation. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much. So I'm going to give a brief overview of links between food safety and nutrition in terms of link out outcomes and physiological responses with focus on one example. This is also the topic of an upcoming review article conducted by GAIN in collaboration with Cornell. Next slide, please. To begin with, uh, what are we talking about when we talk about food safety and nutrition health outcomes? For, for the purposes of this discussion, we can think of the spectrum of food safety outcomes as including both acute and uh, long-term or chronic outcomes acute infection or acute toxicity, as well as the uh, chronic impacts uh, such as uh, carcinogenicity, mutagenicity. And um, we often think of food safety outcomes as just acute disease, but uh, we should keep in mind that, that they're not. Uh, also the sequelae, so the long-term consequences of infectious diseases involve a range of outcomes that are important here. On the other hand, uh, in terms of nutrition uh, related outcomes, uh, we talk about growth indicators such as stunting and wasting, um, nutrition deficiency, uh, diet related chronic diseases, as well as maternal and perinatal health. And this is of course not uh, comprehensive, 
but to give an idea of the outcomes that we have considered. Uh, the um, links between these two sets of outcomes are often bidirectional and often the physiological processes involved uh, in the response of, to foodborne exposure or nutritional inputs impact common outcomes. So it's not just one affecting the other, but really the two sets of processes um, work together to a, a common uh, outcome in parallel or uh, jointly. Uh, one uh, thing to consider is also that we are talking about not inputs, so the hazards that may be ingested or uh, the quantity and type of food ingested as well as the physiological processes that happen in response to this input and ultimately the health outcomes or the growth outcomes. Next slide, please. So we know that uh, stunting is a common indicator of key uh, of malnutrition and, and I don't need to repeat it for this audience. Uh, no, historically, it's been attributed solely to undernutrition, but uh, Recently, we had more and more evidence that it is um, there is a complex network of determinants uh, behind stunting, and the role of foodborne infections or foodborne hazard exposure is still not really talked about in in this context. So uh, here I'm going to point out uh, where foodborne disease uh, plays a role. Next slide, please. If we look at the evidence on the determinants of stunting, we see that they can be approximately divided in four main groups. Uh, this is a review from uh, many studies uh, conducted in 2016 uh, on children age two. And we see that on one hand, we have uh, maternal nutrition and health status in orange and fuchsia, uh, neonatal growth status in blue, uh, child nutrition and health status in yellow, and what they're called as environmental uh, components or context uh, as related to the potential for infection as well as metrics of socioeconomic status. Now, in most of these groups, uh, there is a component of both nutrition and a component of gastroenteric infection. You see, for example, in yellow, childhood diarrhea next to zinc deficiency. Uh, infection is from any route and any um, hazard is usually not attributed to a specific uh, pathogen, for example. But we know that mainly um, diarrheal disease are due to water and food uh, borne exposure. Uh, both these components of nutrition and food safety have multidegenerational impacts. And here we can see that maternal status as well as newborn status have a large impact as determinants. Next slides, please. We now have strong evidence of the association between the real disease and stunting. Uh, that's why this is a, a good example. In other cases, we don't have much to talk about yet. Uh, while most microbial hazard causing the real disease are known, uh, this association between the real and stunting is not uh, for the moment attributed to specific hazards. Now you, you've seen the data on uh, burden. Here I want to point out for comparison uh, that the real disease affects approximately one third of children in developing country. And it's the second leading cause of death in children under five worldwide. And in many contexts, it is a large component of health burden both directly and as determinants of stunting. In comparison, uh, it's estimated that foodborne disease cause approximately 125,000 um, deaths in children under five per year. Uh, to note that the foodborne disease, F FBD, uh, the burden from foodborne disease is not a subset of the real disease. Although often overlapping, uh, but foodborne disease impacts include uh, other uh, health impacts not related to the area. It's important to note that the first estimates of worldwide foodborne disease are very recent, conducted in 2015 with 2010 data. So this is a new emerging field. It's also important to note that diarrhea is not the only foodborne disease associated with stunting. For example, there is strong evidence that exposure to mycotoxin is linked to stunting. Uh, 
Next slide, please. Now, I won't go into detail, but I'll slide with two slides on environmental enteric dysfunction uh, to, and I know I'm running out of time, uh, to point out that uh, environmental enteric dysfunction, ED, is a syndrome that is related to the real disease and present in a broad spectrum of physiological in outcomes. And it can present with or without diarrhea. We can think of it, of diarrhea as the tip of the iceberg of ED. Next slide, please. Uh, we have increasing but weaker evidence on the association of stunting. Uh, in particular, the evidence points, points at the um, links between intestinal inflammation and systemic inflammation and stunting, where here the arrows are associations, not causation. Uh, for other processes, we have either weaker or conflicting evidence. The point overall is that both the infection component and the malnutrition component contribute to growth impairment. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, there are many other links that go beyond the gut and beyond growth outcome per se, and involve the ability to absorb and metabolize nutrients, the immune response, neurological functions, and reproductive health. And when one look at the association and direction of causation between these outcomes, even where there is limited evidence, it is clear that both food prone exposure and nutrition inputs uh, are involved and linked. Next slide, please. So as we revisit the, the framework of the triple burden, uh, we start seeing that foodborne disease has a role uh, in all three components. The good news here is that also successful intervention to reduce one uh, set of these outcomes uh, also results in the reduction of the others and uh, reducing foodborne disease has impact on all of that. So uh, a couple of final remarks here is that it would be very useful to devote more attention to the role of foodborne disease and food safety, as it is an important role of exposure that not often uh, adequately considered in the past. And while food safety intervention often overlap with WASH intervention, there are important differences and some routes of exposure can only be controlled through dedicated food safety intervention. So as the body of evidence grows, uh, effective intervention will have to integrate elements relevant to food safety, nutrition, as well as other causes of disease. And measuring both nutrition and food safety indicators is an important part of this integration. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, um, Elisabetta. You've given a clear depiction of the health impacts emanating from the intersections between food safety and nutrition. And, and you highlighted the data gaps and the complexities of this linkage. Thank you. Our next panelist is Dr. Vivian Hoffman, a senior research fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute and holds a PhD in agricultural economics from Cornell University. Much of her research has focused on household health behavior and farm level technology adoption with an emphasis on post-harvest practices and food safety. Dr. Hoffman has led or co-led large scale randomized controlled trials on farm-based food safety interventions in Kenya and Ghana and investigated the impacts of food safety labeling and independent information on consumers with choices in Kenya. Dr. Hoffman will present on consumer dimensions linking food safety and nutrition. Over to you, Vivian. Thanks very much, Angela. Um, next slide, please. So the first point that I want to make um, is, is something that Stella alluded to. So that's the effect, um, the impact of negative food safety information is very strong and can have a huge impact on people's food choices. You might remember back in the late 90s and early aughts when mad cow disease or BSE was making headlines. Now, if you look at the solid line on the graph I'm showing here, this is beef as a share of total meat consumed in Japan from 2000 to the end of 2004. This drops by over half as soon as BSE is detected in Japan and doesn't recover within the three year span by the data subsequently. You can't see it on the graph, but at the same time, pork, fish and chicken consumption all increased. So making up that difference in meat consumption. 
based on the evidence we have, which is unfortunately restricted to high income countries, consumers generally substitute within category in response to food safety scares. We don't really, at least based on the evidence I've seen, see people switching from salads to biscuits, which is really good news for nutrition. Um, but they might switch from a more dangerous food to what they perceive as a safer food. So raw milk to processed milk, for example. And that safer food might be more expensive. So again, based on countries, uh, studies in rich countries, these substitutions don't seem to make much difference to the overall diet quality, but the situation might be very different in low income settings where the total budget available for food is limited. So if there is reason to tell consumers to avoid a certain type of food because of food safety risks, it's important to recommend similarly priced alternatives or perhaps even use policy levers such as subsidies to ensure that substitutes are affordable. Next slide, please. It's also important to make sure the alternative consumers switch to isn't even more dangerous. In Kenya, for example, the government regularly tests formally milled maize flour with a focus on the most widely distributed brands. Um, for the fungal contaminant aflatoxin. Occasionally, a mandatory recall is issued when high levels of contamination are found. Anecdotally, some, some consumers in response to a recent recall reported switching to whole grain maize flour purchased on the informal market. However, if we compare contamination in this informally traded flour um, on the left of this graph, we can see that it's far worse on average than the national brand that was recalled. Now, we can use, with an abundance of caution, the power of negative information, as Sarah Karyuki and I did in a recent experiment in Kenya. Our team visited several hundred people in a mid-sized Kenyan town in their homes and talked to them about aflatoxin. Some people were randomly selected to be given a recommendation about which brands have the lowest contamination risk. This is maize flour again. Some were given that same information and also had the flour they were currently consuming tested for aflatoxin on the spot. We then came back about two months later to see what everyone was eating. We found that those given only the recommendation about safer brands, shown on the leftmost side of the graph, were behaving similarly to the comparison group. However, those whose maize was tested were more likely to switch to a safer brand, especially those whose maize tested positive for aflatoxin. We conclude from this study that information which both lets consumers know that they are exposed to a food safety risk and gives them information on a safer alternative can motivate change. Next slide, please. Now, the importance of consumer behavior to food safety does not stop at the market. In a recent study in Kasumu, Kenya, members of our research team accompanied caregivers of eight-month-old infants while they shopped for milk. A sample of milk was taken at point of purchase for laboratory analysis. Later in the day, the team visited the caregiver again and took sam a sample of infant food prepared with that same milk. Both samples were tested for contamination with pathogens and other bacteria indicating fe fecal contamination. We found that household handling, which often includes heating milk to boiling or near boiling, killed off some of the bacteria found at point of port purchase. However, households also introduced a fair bit of contamination themselves. In fact, household handling was the most common entry point of pathogens into food. Next slide, please. Now, in the same study, the extent to which bacteria were introduced or removed varied a lot depending on the type of milk. And this seemed to undo some of the improvements to food safety that were achieved at the market level. Consumers seem more likely to adequately heat milk that they had purchased from informal vendors. Contamination in this sort of milk, shown in gray, um, was lower in infant food than it at purchase um, in the milk for all of the organisms studied. In contrast, infant foods prepared with long life UHT milk shown in blue um, were more likely to be contaminated when fed to the infant compared to when the milk was purchased. By the time the milk was consumed by infants, milk bought raw or ultra heat treated was equally contaminated. Next slide, please. So how can food safety be integrated into nutrition programming? First, as we've just seen, households are a major point of entry for pathogens into food. There's a lot of recent work showing that food hygiene interventions targeting households can work. These should be integrated into nutrition education wherever possible. Second, recent work in low-income 
urban environments shows that a lot of infants under six months are consuming foods other than breast milk. It's critical to provide recommendations that fit the needs of caregivers who can't do the first best of exclusive breastfeeding. I'll leave it to the nutritionists in the room what to recommend infants this young should be given if breast milk isn't an option, but caregivers should be told that whatever food it is, whether their infant is six months or a year, um, it should be well heated first, stored in a sealed container, and not stored for too long. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian, for the excellent examples of how poor food safety perception can be a barrier to nutritional gains or vice versa. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Marcus Lipp. He's the senior food safety officer leading food safety work within the food systems and food safety division at the FAO. He coordinates FAO's work on providing chemical and microbiological food safety risk assessment and capacity development work to strengthen national capacities for food safety. Dr. Lip previously worked in various public and private organizations focusing on various topics related to food safety, biotechnology and standard setting, including the US Pharmacopeia, the International Bottled Water Association, Monsanto, Unilever and the European Commission. Dr. Lip holds a PhD in analytical chemistry from the University of Karlsruhe, Germany. You are most welcome, Dr. Lepp. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Angela. And uh, welcome, everybody. My pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for joining us for this, uh, um, for this uh, event today. So we have heard a lot about nutrition and food safety and how it affects us, either from a positive side to nutrition, so what we want, what we need to achieve full potential, but also from a side of what may hold us back, malnutrition, food safety, if there are contaminants above a certain limit or other uh, substances that, that are undesirable about, above a certain limit. So there's household choices that we can make. There's food preparation in the household, which is critical, absolutely crucial. The last mile effect where every other effort can be easily just annihilated if we don't keep up good hygiene in the households and keep up with good practices in households, doing food preparation, storage, and all of that. So these are fantastic. What we wanted to do at this point is how do we get to our food? So supply chains and markets. Next slide, please. Just to recap uh, quickly, we've heard that before. So food safety is where agriculture meets public health. It's the one criteria that separates an agricultural product from something you want to eat is the question, is it safe enough to eat? It's a prerequisite for nutrition. We've heard that in several presentations. Um, supply chains and markets can and do have a large impact on food safety and nutrition. So the food that is arriving at our point of purchase may already have food safety problems or may be nutritionally more or less beneficial depending on its history and uh, processing conditions. And that's what we're going to talk here a little bit about that. Now, um, as in many fields, fields in food safety and nutrition in general. Uh, it's also for supply chains. It's of course not a single thing. It's easy to say supply chains, but it's a staggering diversity that is actually in, in place right now that moves food from the producer to the market, uh, to, the per, uh, to the consumer. So supply chains can be as varied as, as, it, as you can think it. They can be short, they can be long. That can both be a question of distance as well as a question of time. So think uh, maize, corn, that can be stored for months and months and months in, in silos or elevators uh, before it reaches the consumer. Although it may just be next door, but still the time uh, required maybe long, and that's good because it guarantees food availability uh, outside harvest. And uh, so we need those buffers in our supply chains. And then, of course, distance-wise, we all probably have seen uh, products on the market that come from far-flung countries uh, that have been flown by air airlines or other means than transported to us. So these are long travel distances. 
They can, uh, food supply chains can just be happen uh, in open air if you want, uh, on the back of a tractor trailer, on, on, on a bicycle, transported in, in, without any protection, but many require environmental uh, controls. So cold chains, frozen uh, supply chains, um, where, where well, humidity may be controlled, even the, the composition of the air may be controlled that uh, prevents them fruits from ripening and all those things. So it can be incredibly complex. Well, certainly there's either direct supply chains, farmer to consumer, direct door-to-door -door delivery, if you want very simple supply chains, but there are also many multi-hop supply chains. Maybe the easiest is uh, spices, where many small collectors uh, collect spices or grow spices, uh, sell them to traders that sell them to traders, various aggregation levels gets shipped and then it gets disaggregated because the amount of spices that we personally buy then for our personal use are relatively small. So these are multi-hop, many aggregation, disaggregation steps. And then, of course, last but not least, is the processing that happens throughout the supply chain. Some things are directly from the field to, to, the, uh, to our plates or forks or tables. Uh, strawberries, fresh fruits and vegetables in general can be considered this way. Others have multiple processing steps that can be very easy, cleaning grains. that can be rather complicated, like processing oils, processing fats, or making whole meals uh, that are then sold to the final consumer. So supply chains, bottom line, are incredibly complicated. And each and every one has specific aspects that may affect food safety in a positive and a negative way and nutrition in a positive and a negative way, which obviously makes our whole lives uh, rather difficult for all of us to understand these complexities. Next slide, please. So markets, similar variety that can be grouped slightly different. So we have domestic markets uh, and uh, international markets. The international markets are often business to business markets uh, where, where things are just traded internationally. There are requirements and there are agreements in place, SPS agreements, TPT is a sanitary and phytosanitary agreement, a technical barriers to trade agreement, the two most prominent agreements from the World Trade Organization. But there's also many bi and multilateral agreements. <clears throat> Domestic markets can be um, potentially loose in, in terms of oversight and governance, um, where there's less well regulated environment. Many low and middle income countries face that situation, or they are just uh, extremely well regulated uh, and highly functioning in this regard. It's in many high income countries. So, Many uh, different uh, versions that, that uh, have many different requirements and they all, that's the reason why I'm, uh, we are bringing this up here, they all provide, of course, certain incentives for certain products um, that are favored or, let's say, preferentially traded or shipped or offered uh, due to other uh, to the market considerations, to the price considerations. Next slide, please. So in the end, it's about a balancing of needs to the overall effect with, with almost, with many things in food, and food production, food systems is balancing of needs. There's consumer expectations. Consumers need to want to eat that food. Otherwise it is, food waste, food loss, if you want food waste, probably more. So um, what consumers expect is access to safe and nutritious food. Very simply put, uh, Vivian was way, way more eloquent and nuanced in terms of consumer expectation and needs there. But uh, aside from the fact that it needs to be safe and nutritious, there are many pre personal quality criteria that people applied in terms of damages on fruits, taste preferences, or whatever else. And the markets need, it's expected to serve that. From the supply chain operators, of course, uh, the whole story looks a little bit different. What they prefer is anything that's easy to transport. That's cheap. And uh, so that uh, may be 
um, preference from, from supply chain operate, uh, operators uh, that is stable at various temperatures that would result in a potential economic disadvantage for fresh fruits, at least over longer supply chains, because then the fruits would need to be refrigerated and temp uh, atmospheric control employed and, and things like this. There might be an advantage even uh, considering the, the supply chain efficiency for prepackaged food, which uh, is then typically translates into more processed foods, which may not be nutritionally as desirable, but they're easy to transport. And hence, they can be probably more um, available just due to market favors. Um, then, of course, um, we have this question of sustainability. In our current understanding of food systems, in our current understanding of how we can successfully continue to live on this planet, we have to learn to operate our food systems, everything, production, supply, transport, uh, consumption, everything within sustainability boundaries. And then that will shift food systems, that will shift supply chains uh, in the future to come. Certain supply chains may be just disfavored because they are extremely long, they're extremely energy efficient, and uh, that may not match the sustainability criteria that can also apply to those that are uh, an energy intensive by mere uh, feature of maintaining controlled conditions and various uh, foods. Next slide, please. So uh, we can continue with a balancing of needs because that's where the crux are on us finding a, the optimal solution to operate our food systems. Long supply chains increase demands on coordinated food control systems. Surveillance monitor needs to be, um, monitoring needs to be improved. Multiple countries may be involved. These needs to be demonstrated, data need to flow um, because of traceability requirements that are particularly then relevant in high income country markets, but increasingly so in low mi and middle income country markets. Um, low and middle income countries are marred by a governance gap between domestic and international supply chains, where international supply chains are typically much more controlled and governed and the domestic markets may lack such instruments. Uh, that will hold back food safety and nutritional uh, um, efforts on, on, the, on the domestic market, although the exported food may match high, uh, the, the high level criteria from the international markets, the domestic food may not match that. High income countries, uh, typically that gap is rather close or low, uh, small, and uh, so that's not a, a big problem in this case. So. As a summary, if you want, it's that supply chains and markets are intrinsic and indispensable part of our food systems. We cannot do without. We have to have markets in our current understanding. Food needs to be transported. Uh, nobody, particularly with the urbanization, nobody can grow all their food on the balcony if they even have a balcony. Um, so that, and, and that requires the management of food safety, quality, and nutrition criteria throughout the supply chain, throughout the markets, incentives need to be created that result in the achievement of safe and nutritious food. That is the job of the currently uh, in front of us, the transformation of our food systems. To achieve this tran uh, trans these transformation in a sustainable manner as an additional boundary condition, because whatever we have to do, we have to operate within the limits of our planets. So we need to find, strengthen those incentives we understand, and we need to develop new incentives, and uh, we need to agree on new incentives that uh, will allow us to modify our markets, to modify our supply chains, ultimately our food systems, in order to achieve all of that. Sustainable, safe, nutritious food for everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've highlighted many complex factors influencing food safety in supply chains. Uh, I've realized we still have a lot to do to retool food markets and supply chains for that essential food system transformation in a sustainable way. We appreciate that, Marcus. 
our last speaker, but certainly not the least, is Pawan Agarwal, former CEO of Food Safety and Standards Authority of India. He is a 1985 batch Indian Administrative Service Officer of West Bengal Cadre. He also served as Secretary in the Department of Consumer Affairs under the Ministry of Consumer Affairs, Food and Public Distribution in 2020. Currently, he is an honorary advisor to Food Future Foundation in India. You are most welcome, Ms. Agarwal. We are ready for your presentation. Thank you, thank you, Angela. He Hello, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Uh, so I think uh, uh, both research, evidence, and common sense shows that uh, food safety and nutrition, they are bi-directionally linked, and there are a lot of overlaps between them. I think if you look at common sense, we are talking of the same food that has to be safe and also nutritious. So as Bonnie mentioned, despite uh, such obvious linkages between food safety and nutrition, in policy and programs at national, subnational level, or even at the global level, this is not embedded in our design of new programs, new thinking about it. This is required to be done at three levels at the level of policy, at the level of programming, and third, uh, you know, by scaling up those programs, how do we create a culture wherein food safety and nutrition are looked at holistically? Next slide, please. I share with you the Indian example of integrated approach. As Angela mentioned, I had the privilege of uh, leading the country's uh, Food Safety and Standards Authority of India for four years. And uh, like other countries, we also have different ministries handling different aspects of the food system. Uh, food safety is primarily looked at uh, by the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Animal Husbandry and Dairying, a separate ministry, Ministry of Food Processing and Ministry of Consumer Affairs, Food and Public Distribution. While the issues of nutrition are primarily within the remit of Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Ministry of Women and Child Development, as you can see, this is only six of the ministries and departments in the government of India, and there are many more. The Food Safety and Standards Authority of India, which was created in 2006, you know, to lay down science-based standards of food and regulate them end to end in production and handling, has a specific mention that the mandate of the food authority is to ensure safe and wholesome food. The word nutrition is not really mentioned in the entire legislation. But the wholesome, I think the legislature wanted uh, uh, to suggest that the food has to be nutritious as well. And therefore, we took upon ourselves to create standards, both for food safety and nutrition. Some next, next slide, please. Some of the standards uh, uh, that the Food Authority created were standards for fortified food, standards for transfats by you know, fixing limits on what, trans, what levels of transfats are allowed, uh, what could be termed as uh, zero transfat regulations on labeling and claims, including front of the pack labeling, which is currently work in progress, standards on food supplements, food for special dietary uses, and school food regulations. These are, this is the illustrative list of uh, regulations and standards that uh, India has put in place through the FSSAI, which deal not only with the uh, food safety, but primarily around nutrition. And several of our regulations now look at food safety and nutrition issues in a holistic manner. Next slide, please. In terms of programming intervention, you know, I think looking at it from a demand side and also from the supply side is so important. And in that respect, you know, we designed a program, what is referred to as Eat Right India program, which is a bouquet of 22 activities and interventions with many touch points in both in the supply and demand side of the food system that can potentially bring about large scale change in the food system. These initiatives are community led mass movement, changing food environments, changing food, uh, environments in schools in particular, and 
on the supply side you know the focus is on targeting all supply chain actors you know particularly focus on the informal sector and ensure that not only food safety is ensured but nudging uh, you know supply of uh, nutritious food next slide please as you can see from uh, this uh, depiction of how different uh, you know aspects of food safety and nutrition are integrated together uh, you know i'll not go through this slide but uh, it just goes on to suggest that uh, it handles all these aspects in an integrated manner next slide please the uh, eat right movement you know deals with not only food safety issues and uh, nutritious food issues but also sustainable diet issues and uh, also converges with uh, various flagship schemes of the government of india which uh, run across the country uh, on i think somebody mentioned about uh, wash program you know swachhata hi seva hai is a big program of the government of india focusing on uh, water and sanitation Ocean Abhiyan is another initiative which is targeting at supplementary nutrition, particularly for children. And uh, similarly, Jal Shakti Abhiyan is focused on sustainable water supplies. So, you know, programming has been done in a manner that it integrates with these ongoing programs and uh, brings together the issues of food safety and nutrition together holistically. Next slide, please. finally you know these programs have to be scaled up and the scaling up is just not possible by one agency or one ministry of the government so as i mentioned before you know converges with other flagship programs of the government so it has to involve frontline workers across different uh, ministries and departments you know ensure that uh, the initiatives and programs that are designed at the national level reach right up to the grassroots level you know bring the districts villages and towns into the fold of the programs that are designed at national level through eat right district challenge eat right city challenge as we speak one third of the country through this challenge is being brought under the purview of the eat right uh, uh, program state food safety index that uh, the fssci had instituted to benchmark uh, food safety administration in different states and provinces in the country include several indicators that have nutrition focus and these create engagement and excitement of the states and lower functionary right up to the grassroots level and finally involving the private sector the professionals of food and nutrition the country created a network of professionals of food and nutrition across chefs food technologists dietitians nutritionists medical doctors public health experts and food analysts next please all the resources that have been created as you can see the different colors of these books the yellow book for targeting at schools the pink book targeting at households the orange book targeting at workplaces you know these integrate food safety and nutrition beautifully and these are being used in the eat right india movement across the country you know and this uh, india's example uh, of uh, uh, integrating food safety and nutrition have been you know surveyed and studied through a case study by world bank and this is available on the net the resource book that uh, fssci has created they are also available for adaptation and adoption by different countries around the world i think what india has been able to do though this is just the beginning is integrating adopting an integrated approach in a country as large as india through this you know integrated policy and regulation creating programming which is innovative and finally scaling up to ensure that we have a culture wherein food safety and nutrition are looked at holistically thank you very much Thank you very much. It is interesting to know all the bold initiatives to scale up integrated food safety and nutrition interventions in India. We certainly have a lot to learn from India. Um, 
that, that's the end of our panelist presentation. It was great listening to all your presentations. We'll now transition into the Q&A session. Um, and we have some questions from the audience. We'll try and cover as many questions as possible. The first question goes to um, Elisabetta. The question says, kindly explain your definition of foodborne disease. Does it include waterborne disease not transmitted by a food? If yes, then I presume when you say food safety interventions, you mean also wash interventions. Isn't that mixing two distinct things? Thank you, that's a great question. And I, I will just say um, a couple of things. It's a, a topic that deserves a whole other uh, long conversation, of course. Uh, there are definitely many overlapping uh, components and processes to wash on one side and food safety on the other. Think, for example, of uh, irrigation water and how food is grown in the field or manure application in vegetable crops uh, and uh, how that can uh, circulate in the environment. So it, without doubt, uh, interventions uh, on either food safety or wash will impact the other in, in important ways. Uh, I think that's another field where integration is important, as well as um, there are aspects where uh, processes are distinct. Uh, for example, if you think of home food handling or handling of food at the market, uh, that involves the quality of water, right? If you wash uh, your vegetables uh, at home, for example, um, that the quality of the water is important, but there are also other aspects of how you handle the food, if it's refrigerated, if cooked and raw food are in touch with each other, that are um, more specifically uh, relevant to food safety interventions. And so are many in the supply chain in terms of processing, food processing, uh, that may or may not be related to quality of water and waste. Uh, so I think I am not going to say much more, but it's a great question because uh, there are room for both a lot of integration, but also a lot of um, really un unearthing and, and clarify the role of food safety specifically. As you've seen in the slides of determinants of stunting, there is this component of infection that could be waterborne, could be foodborne, could be in some cases person to person. Uh, could be from objects, but uh, mostly from water and food. Uh, and the food component is not explicitly talked about until recently. Uh, so I think it's important to keep in mind that diarrhea is not just water, waterborne, um, but there are many, many components. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'm curious if other panelists have more to say on this. Thank you, Elisabetta. Uh, you've explained it clearly. If there are no more comments from the panelists, I'll move on to the next question. I think what just to, sorry, just to expand okay. on that one thing. I mean, I, I think we all know that wash is incredibly important, but if you look at the, the concentration of microbes present in water compared to the concentration of microbes present in infant foods, it's far, far higher in infant foods. This is a really beautiful growth medium for bacteria. And so making sure that we keep the contaminated water potentially away from those infant foods is incredibly important and making sure that households are heat treating their foods appropriately prior to, to feeding to infants and storing them well. Thanks. Thank you, Vivian. The next question is, is related actually. Um, it says, while it is likely diarrhea affects ab ab absorption of nutrients, sorry, and hence may affect nutrition, how much of stunting or other forms of malnutrition can truly be attributed to diarrhea? Do we have any estimates of this? Um, Elisabetta, do you want to comment on this or any of our panelists? Sure, I can start and then I'm also inviting other comments. Uh, and I'm reading, I think this is the one that came in in the chat. So I think the, the quantitative 
estimate of the strength of association, uh, causation, and how much is due to one thing versus another, that's the front line, right, where we're getting more uh, evidence, but it's also, um, we don't know everything by any stretch of the imagination. So it's still important to collect data uh, because, of course, it has implications. Do we do a wash intervention? Do we do a food safety intervention? Do we do um, something else? What has the most impact? Uh, so you see, there are studies, the slides that I uh, shown earlier, I don't know if, uh, Abby, you can uh, load that up, uh, shows a quantitative estimate of attribution by um, type of determinants. So we're starting to have a quantitative estimate of that. Uh, I see Stella also has a hands raised, so I, I want to pass the microphone to her and Marcus as well. Thank you. Yeah, can sure, I can. Um, thanks, Angela. Um, just to build a bit on, on what uh, Elisabetta was saying, and also Marcus gave a great answer to this written in the Q&A window. Um, I think it, it is true that a lot of the evidence on this topic is through associational studies, which obviously cannot have the same kind of um, evidence quality to truly show causation in all cases. And there are some that might dispute whether there's an actual causal relationship. Overall, I find the evidence to be fairly um, convincing. But another thing that I wanted to mention is that there is also a link in the other direction. Um, there's pretty strong evidence that nutritional inadequacies, particularly micronutrient deficiencies, can increase the risk of having severe diarrheal episodes, whether that diarrhea is caused by unsafe food, unsafe water, or other causes. So there is a link going in the other direction too, which is quite well supported by the existing evidence. And also just to, I mean, to zoom out a little bit, something that we we didn't have time to go into nuance when kind of showing the, uh, the nice graphs with associations and um, associated burdens. But at the end of the day, when we're looking at stunting, we're looking at it not so much because we're actually interested in stunting as an outcome, but because we see it as a marker for child's growth more, more broadly. If a child is stunted, that likely means that their development is being compromised in many different ways and not optimally supported in different ways also, some of which might be due to direct things like having diarrhea, which could be related to unsafe food, but also to broader causes. So I think at the end of the day, we can all agree we want children that are not sick. As part of that, we want to make sure that those children have food that's safe to eat. We want to make sure that that food that they're getting is nutritious. And part of the way to address that and to address stunting more broadly is actually to go to the, the um, base causes, things like reductions in poverty, increasing access to education, increasing access to infrastructure for WASH. So stunting, it's a useful marker. But at the end of the day, it's, it is a marker and not actually the thing that we care about so much. So whenever evaluating policies related to food safety or nutrition, important to think about kind of what do they do to those root causes as opposed to the marker that we look at. Thanks. Thank you. Marcus, do you have additional comments? Uh, yeah, maybe just to emphasize that point that Stella has made or started to make. I, I think it, while these are very fascinating discussions and, you know, I work in science, so I'm, I'm happy to discuss science and the strength of evidence and studies that we need to do to heighten this or that uh, strength of evidence. This is lovely, but if, if we look at what people need, what we all need, what we consumer all need, it's access to safe, nutritious food, which means we need to have enough money. There needs to be a market nearby. And uh, the, the, the food that gets offered needs to be safe and nutritious. Uh, these are fundamental needs that every human being had, that every child needs to grow. There are additional factors that we need to have a happy and fulfilled life, but these are the basic ones. Now, a lot of um, um, food safety problems can be connected to poverty, of course. Uh, we are living in a... In a, in a money-driven society, so access to money will, will be a determinant in almost anything we do. Um, and that's, that's just trivial from that perspective. Um, but let's, let's focus on what is the need. So we need access to safe water. We need access to clean water. We need access to clean food. There are various ways we can get to that, but it is absolutely critical and essential for children and for everybody to, to sustain life. Thank you. Thank you. 
Our next question is for Pawan. What can you suggest practically on how to increase nutritional status with regards to food safety, where mostly families in developing countries are still struggling to fulfill the quantity of food they consume and the quality of food will become their second or last priority. Sometimes purchasing high quality and safe food could become more expensive. You know, uh, I think this is a very important question, particularly in COVID times. Uh, uh, and uh, the only intervention to address the affordability issue is uh, direct government intervention in terms of uh, providing for nutritious food for citizens at large who cannot afford uh, such kind of food. Uh, and uh, during the COVID times and even before that, you know, India has done remarkably well in terms of providing, uh, uh, you know, social protection programs uh, in terms of food supplies uh, to the poorest of the poor and spending uh, billions of dollars uh, in these kind of social protection programs. They need to be expanded, uh, you know, in poorer countries because uh, uh, the nutritious food sometimes tends to be uh, more expensive, and uh, that is what uh, the data suggests. So, social, you know, robust social protection programs is the way forward. Thank you, Pawan. Our next question goes to Vivian. Can you share some strategies to empower consumers to make the right food safety choices? Sure. So, I mean, I've done some work looking at the impact of food safety labeling on consumer choice. Um, those sorts of strategies where the food is, is labeled by the food processor, they have a short term impact, but they don't have a long long-term impact. I think if we want people to really understand what food is safe and what food is not safe, they need to be given external information. So we can't expect the market to solve this. There has to be some public sector, you know, involvement to, to let consumers know what is safe and what is less safe. Um, it's really important also that they're given alternatives that are affordable for them. So I think one of the comment, the comment that just came up that Pawan answered um, had to do with, you know, how are consumers going to prioritize spending more on safer food when they can't even afford enough food in the first place? Not all food, not all safe food has to be more expensive. So if you think about street vended food, pre-cut fruits, which are often fed to young children um, in, in data that I've collected in Kenya, you know, this is an incredibly high risk because somebody's touching it, you don't know this person, you don't know what kind, you know, they, they don't have access to sanitation. Um, it, kind of encouraging consumers to, to focus on, you know, preparing it in home and then preparing it in a way that they control and that is food safe. Um, these sorts of interventions, they don't need to be expensive, um, but the, just basic hygiene around food is probably the number one intervention. And that's, that shouldn't all be in the hands of the consumers. I think we really need to focus focus on adequate provision of infrastructure to these communities too. A lot of the you know, food safety problems are going to be most acute in, in low income urban environments where you have long food value chains and really poor access to, to wash sanitation and, and, and running water, um, clean water. And so if, if we can get clean water into these communities, if we can get sanitation, improved sanitation to these communities and, and education to consumers about safe food handling, all of these ingredients will be necessary. And consumers are one part of it, but I think public infrastructure um, and public provision of information are also incredibly important. Thanks. Thank you. We need to push a lot of that information out there so consumers know what to do. Um, our next question would go to Marcus. How do I choose an intervention that will address the issues discussed, especially in developing countries like Nigeria? Yeah, that, that's, a, that, that's of course the, the question, right? So how, how do I develop um, a successful intervention within the means that are available to us. I mean, we all have limitations. Um, and so how does that look like? Um, I think there are two different ways to, to look at that. And then there's anything in between. So two different extremes. The one extreme is uh, if you want uh, the, the motto of the World Food Safety Day that FAO and WHO celebrate every 7th of June, food safety is everyone's business. So we all need to work together. I spoke briefly about the last mile problem. Food can be safe 
up to the supermarket, if I don't treat it well at home, it still will make me sick. Um, so, or food can be unsafe the whole way, and then that's also not helping. Um, so we all have to work together. The other extreme to look at that is, and sorry, I brought this up because there's a lot of uh, connecting to what Vivian said, um, there's a lot of intervention at the household level that can be done, that can be effective, but it does not suffice. The other level is the public system. Governance, food safety governance. There needs to be a food safety governance level. And uh, food safety essentially is a lot, it's just trust. High income countries do a lot of surveillance and monitoring and can afford to do that. But nobody tests every food product on the market. So we essentially trust that the one that got tested is similar to the one that I will buy. And uh, there's good reason to trust that. And then we have a safe food supply. That's a difficult thing to achieve because the food system is so vast, there's so many actors and, and it's, it's expensive. So to get a whole society up to that level of surveillance, monitoring and governance that I can just simply trust the food safety uh, of, of products that are in commerce, very challenging thing. Um, so, but we need everything in between as well. We need schools to raise awareness and to have some programs in schools that, that teach awareness, that raise awareness. We need uh, specific work and value chains. We need help uh, programs that help mothers understand how to keep infant formula food sa uh, safe or to pick up on the example from Vivian again, to you know, pre prepare food at home, take it with you because you don't know how that uh, street vendor cut up the, the whatever fruit it is that you can purchase. All of that, and, it, and we need all of that. We need every and single one of these interventions. So I think there is more opportunity then there are people who try to implement those opportunities and I'm positive that there are many of opportunities in Nigeria and not, there's not a single magic opportunity that will solve all the food safety problems uh, at once, but there's many, many, many individual food uh, opportunities that we need to realize to improve food safety. It's, it's all about doing tomorrow better than we did today. Food safety is, is an ongoing process. It's a process that needs constant vigilance, constant investments, constant work. And our only hope is that we can do tomorrow better than we did today and then the day after again better. And this is how a whole food supply chain gets safer and provides safer and more nutritious food. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Um, we have time for one last question which goes to Stella. Can you please explain more about the diarrheal contributing to stunting? Was the data based on incidence of diarrheal incidences and assumes it is not adequately treated or assumes repeated untreated cases and its impact? So I think this one was answered already a bit in the chat, um, but what I'm going to do actually instead of answering this is I'm going to send the questioner um, links to some of the original research on this that has undertaken kind of systematic reviews and meta analyses of existing studies on this, so they can kind of look into the full details because it is a very nuanced topic, um, which I think probably if somebody's really interested in it merits them digging into it um, in full details as opposed to what we have time for in the last minute here. Okay, thank you very much. It's been an insightful session and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Over to you, Bonnie. Thank you, Angela. Um, and thank you all panelists. I have been furiously taking notes. This has been an incredibly uh, deep conversation. We began with Stella's keynote, which really let's all remember for the people on the call and for us, we are passionately committed to the, these numbers here, 600 million, 60 million cases, half a million deaths, most in low and middle income countries, 40% of them children. It is a direct overlap to the target populations we're looking at in nutrition. Um, Stella, you presented the pathways with which we can begin to look at that. 
And, um, and Elisabetta, you went right into the details of really what are these incidents and what are the numbers and what is it showing us? Um, and, and really this whole linkage between foodborne disease and the nutritional outcomes of stunting. Um, the consumer, Viv Vivian, you brought the consumers front and center. Um, thank you. And we all know working in the context where we all are working, the challenge of the traditional markets and the idea that the consumer can actually perhaps shape those markets for food safety is something you've done some seminal work in. And as you know, GAINS program and Eat Safe, um, an enormous flagship program from USAID, is directly asking those questions. How much can consumer demand shape markets um, for nutritious and safe foods? We have, um, we have uh, Marcus, Marcus, amazing. Thank you for bringing in the planetary boundaries to all of this. Um, and the private, uh, the whole supply chain and the incentives that need to be in place in order for this to happen. Um, and Pawan, Pawan, you are a champion. You've been a champion for an enormous amount of time for food safety. And for those don't know, I, I encourage you to, to understand India's programs. You know, the, the Safe Food Initiative, the Eat Right Initiative in India um, has, has starting from the base, you know, they have done a remarkable thing and Pawan being an architect and implementer of that program um, in his career, they've trained over 300 and, what is it, three, over 330,000 food safety specialists and supervisors working in the field and at the grassroots level and Pawan, you to be congratulated. So everyone, thank you for joining us. Food safety is here. We need to be on the nutrition agenda. And we are here to work with you, the food safety specialists. We need this integration. And there are, there are many ways we'll pull it together. So um, thank you very much for joining. Please eat safe and be safe in this challenging time. Thank you. Thank you.